Firstly, to introduce myself, as Laura said, my name is Dr. Samia Khatun. I am a historian of race relations across the British imperial world. I'm trained as a feminist historian and I joined the Centre for Gender Studies now two years ago. And it's been a very, very, very exciting, exciting place to work. You can probably tell by my accent that I'm Australian. Uh, if you have any problems with understanding Please, uh, please go back to the Q&A and slow down, stuff like that. Now, I want to welcome you to the Gender Studies space tonight. It's a very, very, very unique space in the um, university world. And it's very unique because it's one of the very, very, very few spaces that's actually created in response to a social justice movement. And of course, I'm talking about feminism. Now, there are very few places inside universities that are actually always in transition and in dynamic dialogue with social justice movements in the same way that gender studies space is. Some of you may or may not know, but gender studies spaces grew out of what were women's studies departments and as I said they were established firstly in the 70s, 60s and 70s and so on as feminist movements gained ground. Now what is special, what is special about the SOAS gender studies space is of course the fact that we are at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies. Now what that means is that we have a geographical focus on Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. When you come to a space such as the Centre for Gender Studies at SOAS, you are immediately pulled beyond any kind of Eurocentrism. You are pulled beyond any kind of, um, I guess, boundness to Western feminisms, which have always shaped what feminist discourse uh, looks like. So immediately at a space like the Center for Gender Studies at SOAS, what you are stepping into is a space that is going to be challenging your hegemonic feminisms. It's not only going to be challenging the world which is structured around binary gender, it is also going to be challenging your white feminisms, your elite feminisms, okay? So this is what we at the Centre for Gender Studies at SOAS really pride ourselves in being at the absolute forefront of. We challenge the normative discourses around gender, around feminism, around the various different things that you're going to be hearing about today. Now, I'm going to, at the end of um, my lecture and also in Q&A, come back to the programs and what it is that we actually run at the Centre for Gender Studies. But the taster lecture that I wanted to give you today was actually about the re relationship of gender and the project to decolonize the human. Now, from the very beginning of the theorization of universal human being. So this idea that there is such a thing as a universal human being across the entire world. From the moment of the inception of that idea, the theorization and sort of uh, definition of who is the human being has always been tied intricately to processes of racial capitalism and the definition of who counts as a human has always been an incredibly incredibly political one so today i want to go into some detail about what it might mean to decolonize conceptions of the human and precisely what gender might have to do with that now we might say that it comes out of Enlightenment thought from late 18th century Enlightenment thought, this very idea of the universal human. And from the very moment that it is invented as a white person, there has been a pushback from colonized peoples from across the world. So we're looking at a good 200 plus years of pushback from various different movements that have demanded for the decolonization of this concept of the human. The very earliest such movement you might even think of as the Haitian Revolution. 
So the Haitian Revolution happens in the 1790s and is one of the first uh, uprisings of enslaved peoples in Haiti who are colonized by um, the uh, French um, slave planters in a sugar plantation economy. And the Haitian Revolution is often cited as the very first moment where peoples, you know, sort of go, no, you're claiming all this stuff about universal human rights in France, but here in the French colonies, you're enslaving people. There is a contradiction there, okay? Now, across many, many years, across centuries, across decades, there have been moments after moment after moment like that where there have been challenges. You might think of most recently, the biggest challenge being uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, okay? So here in London, in the aftermath of the brutal murder that we all witnessed uh, in Minnesota in uh, the US, Black Lives Matter movements absolutely grew across the world, but also in the streets of London and across Britain. And many of you would have seen the image of the statue of Edward Colston, a 16th century slaver, being pushed into the river in the city of Bristol in, in Britain. Um, so Ed, for those of you who might not know the background to that story, Edward Colston uh, was a 16th century slaver who that statue has always been a very contentious issue and in the aftermath uh, of the Black Lives Matter movement gaining ground, it, you Black Lives Matter protesters demanded that this, you know, this just cannot continue to be something we celebrate. So one of the ways to understand that particular toppling of the statue is of course to say protesters here are demanding uh, recognition of racial capitalism being underpinned by the foundational institution of slavery, okay? So it's a challenge to racial capitalism that needs to actually happen in order for the decolonization of the human. Another way you might interpret the throwing of the statue into Bristol Harbour is these are people who are demanding that this historical narrative that really sort of, um, I guess, um, celebrates, celebrates the narrative of slavery having been something that's ultimately done some good or empire being a narrative that's ultimately done good. They're challenging that historical narrative. And the third thing you might understand it as doing is actually challenging the very conception of the human that today structures our world, a conception of the human that has at its very pinnacle this white male subject that is understood to be the most advanced form of human being and human dignity, okay? Now, what I want to talk about is this deeper uh, sort of invitation that this moment actually calls for, this deeper invitation to actually look at how the human subject is constituted, how we even think about universal human being, what would it look like to actually have different forms of human subjectivity that don't have at their very pinnacle um, the white man, okay? I'm going to come back to what gender has to do with all of this and how gender is absolutely central to this particular story about um, what a universal human should look like. Now, what I want to suggest to you is that there is a very particular fiction, a very particular and very powerful fiction that underpins that particular statue that was thrown into Bristol Harbour. Now I'm going to share my screen so that you get to see this particular fiction. Um, let me just do it here. Here we go. Okay. So there we go. This is a powerful fiction which says that civilization, this is what you might describe as civilizational discourse, okay? This is a story that says that civilization is something like a torch. You, it is a torch that begins in the lands of African and indigenous peoples. It moves 
from the lands of African and Indigenous peoples to the lands of Asian peoples, then to the land of Middle Eastern peoples, then to the lands of white peoples, okay? Now, this torch of civilization notion comes from the late 18th century and is very 18th century and soon disappears because eventually the torch idea disappears. But what remains is this notion that this story here, the motion of this torch of civilization actually shows us how civilizations are evolving and changing. So there is this idea that peoples in Africa, peoples in Aboriginal Australia, peoples in native Canada, they are peoples who are somehow behind Asian peoples, who are themselves then behind Middle Eastern peoples, who are then themselves behind white peoples, okay? So this very, very, very powerful fiction, if you are all here with me and I could actually ask you, what is this called? What is the name of this story? I wonder what you would say, okay? What a really good descriptor for this tale is, is the word progress and the word development, okay? You would all be very, very, very familiar with the idea of progress, with the idea of a society that is progressing somewhere, a society that is getting better and better and better with time. So what I want you to have a think about is, is this idea of progress and development actually something that we can actually wrest away from this racial logic that I've outlined here? So I would argue, no, if, if you were here as a class, I would say, tell, tell me, is it possible to have a story of progress that isn't actually about the human race moving from race to race to race to race to race? Now, what I want to also say before I get to how gender is related to this story is, you might, when you first look at this tale, you might go, okay, this is actually a geographical tale. This is about Africa, Asia, Middle East, Europe, okay? It looks like it's kind of about space. But a deeper look at it will also tell you that this is a story that is profoundly about time. This idea that somehow peoples can be behind other peoples in time. So this notion that... so. I don't think I mentioned it, but I'm Bangladeshi by birth. This idea that if Bangladesh as a country, if Bangladeshis as people develop enough, eventually they will be civilized like white civilizations or white peoples. This notion is deeply, deeply a temporal one. When you start realizing that this is this story of progress is both temporal one and start to see how binary gender is absolutely central to the operation of this story. Now, one of the ways that you might say binary gender is central to it is we saw that the statue that is being toppled by decolonize the university movements or Black Lives Matter movements, it's a statue of the white masculinist subject right so in a sense at the pinnacle of this story is this idea that white man stands at the top of it that's one way in which gender is operating in in this story another very key way that gender is operating here is gender and gender rights operates here to mark how civilized a society is so whether or not a society or a people treat women or treat their women well is the marker for where they are supposed to be placed on this scale of civilizational progress. So this, this plays out both in progress narratives and you, some of you might be more familiar with development stories, right? So maternal um, mortality figures or girl education statistics, right? So the more girls a country is educating, the closer it is to civilization. that idea. So 
this story that I'm showing you here is actually absolutely central to many, many, many feminist NGOs, many, many, many social justice organizations that are working towards a better world and have, which have a very explicit feminist project. So what I want to suggest to you is the project to decolonize the idea of the human is actually about separating the idea of the human from this story. But the challenge for us is, if you are to separate the, the formation of the human from this story, how do you imagine better futures? How do you imagine a time over the horizon that is better? Because that is ultimately what progress as a story allows you to do. Now, one of the things that we at the Centre for Gender Studies are forced into reckoning with is this very complex contradiction where as a gender studies space, we invite and attract peoples who are involved in queer organizing, who are involved in feminist organizing, who are involved in the most exciting types of movements going around, going on around the world. How do we decolonize our feminisms so that we are not bound to this racialized logic that I am pointing to here? Now, one of the things that is absolutely important to look at at a place like SOAS is SOAS has, of course, played a very key part in actually institutionalizing this story about the world because SOAS as an institution was set up to train imperial officers and to train British imperial officers working in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. So it will come as no surprise to you that in the SOAS library, <laughs> one of the most, you know, well-read books is Edward Said's Orientalism. And I'm sure many in this audience would have read Edward Said's Orientalism, would have come across Edward Said's Orientalism. So one of the reasons that this is such a, as you can see there from the uh, SOAS library Twitter feed, very, very, very important text for this institution. One of the reasons that it's very important for this institution is many of the scholars, many of the writers, many of the knowledge producers about the other that Saeed was critiquing when he wrote this book in 1978, many of them are SOAS scholars. So SOAS as an institution is very much caught up in the very production of the, the sort of colonial concept of the human being. What that means for us today as teachers, as students, as new generations in this space is, if this was a space from which a narrative like this was implemented, instituted, disseminated, then this, can also be a place from which we must tackle this problem of dismantling colonial notions of the human, okay? Now, at the Center for Gender Studies, what you will find is that we will be not only looking at how do you critique and understand how gender in the world works, You'll also be looking at how do you critique and understand how racial logics work in feminist discourse. You will also be looking at are there other stories apart from this one in relation to which human beings can be defined, okay? If you are in a class with me, I would ask you, tell me, do you think it is possible to get away from this story? And if we were to try and get away from this story, where would we go? Okay, I might leave it there for today and just turn over for um, the next bit, which 
is the questions. Thanks, Samia. That was a really engaging talk and, and, and thank you for that presentation. Um, if anyone does have any questions for Samia or about the about the talk or also about the program at SOAS, um, or if you have any questions about the student experience or more general questions about SOAS, do feel free to put those in the Q&A box. I think we, we may have lost Samia there for a moment, um, but if you do have any questions uh, for her, uh, do put them in the box. Hopefully she'll be back with us in a moment. Ah, there we go. <laughs> ah, you're on mute. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry about that, internet connection failed. So we've got a few questions I think coming through for you Samia at the moment. Okay. So where will they, is it in the Q&A uh, chat? Yeah, it's in the Q&A section, that's right. Okay, all right, so we've got Sana who's joining from Lahore. Hello, Sana. Uh, we've got Raphael asking, what are the most popular modules taken on the course? Okay, so we have two modules which are uh, core modules, okay? So gender theory and the study of Asia, Africa and the Middle East. So everyone does that everyone does that you have to do that and then there's also the dissertation methods which is uh preparation to write a dissertation and everyone takes that so in addition to that we have a number of different uh modules and i'm just going to put them up here because i prepared for you um, there we go. So I've got a list of all the modules and programs just here. Okay. So this year we started a new module called Transnationalizing Queer, Trans and Disability Studies. And that's off to a really huge start. One of the most popular modules we have is Queering Migrations and Diaspora. That one is always just gets the best student feedback and is, is just always full to the brim. Queer politics is also another one that's a really big favorite for our students. Now, in addition to what you're seeing here, we also have a range of different subjects that are, you know, attend to the theme of gender or attend to gender, but actually located in different departments. So there's going to be different gender courses in the development studies uh, unit. There's going to be some in history. There's going to be some in law. And so it is a very, very, very wide range of um, courses. And we've also got, I think uh, one of them's actually missing here. Oh no, gender in the Middle East. That one also gets a lot of student um, uh, very excited about it. There's Mid, the, mid, we have a very strong Middle East strand here because we've actually got a couple of our MA programs which have Middle East pathways. So I hope that's answered your question. And to the next question. Um, hi, not really a question. Uh, is the class, are the classes very participatory and discussion based? They absolutely are, Tanya. The, we're obviously, all of higher education is now straightjacketed into this Zoom box thing. But I mean, I, I wish I could have interacted with you even in Zoom. It's been the most incredible, uh, it's been the most incredible six months of very, very, very wonderful dialogue with our students, even despite the platform. So it's very, very, very participatory in its teaching style. So for, for instance, gender theory, which everyone is doing, is a two hour seminar and a one hour tutorial, okay? So the two hour seminar has everyone in it. So this year we had 56 people. Now, what ends up happening is you've got 56 participants and you've got a lecturer like me. And usually I would do like a very much question and answer kind of, you know, I would have asked you if you if this was a if this was actually a classroom setting, I would have asked you, what do you think gender has to do with this story of progress? 
and then people start say, talking and it becomes this incredible mode of thinking that as a lecturer, I can tell you, is truly, truly thrilling. It's just this completely other mode of thinking when you're thinking in dialogue with this range of people that come from completely different places in the world and are embedded in movements in all sorts of other places in the world. So it is that dialogue in which we do the thinking. And that is precisely why the SOAS classroom is so exciting. So definitely very, very, very participatory. And as I said, because that seminar is has so many people in it, it's got 56 this year. So we have the smaller tutorials so that you have a smaller group of people for those people who are shyer, for those people who need to be able to go deeper into the theoretical texts that we're reading with the assistance of a tutor. So at all the different formats we have, absolutely foreground that participatory nature offered. This year, because of Zoom, we've had to make sure that everything is recorded and is available online, but our focus always, always is that participatory dialogue mode because ultimately we want to think with you not tell you how to think yeah so see what has asked can you tell us more about the gender studies center in SOAS okay so I guess I went through a little bit of this at the beginning of the lecture I guess we were started in 2007 and we've been going for quite some time and at what we're known for, what our reputation is, is being at the forefront of that kind of intersectional feminism that is able to look at race, that is able to look at sexuality, that is able to look at trans politics and go, how does this challenge normative feminisms? Okay, so the Center for Gender Studies at SOAS operates through this series of uh, postgraduate programs. So they're MA programs as well as PhD programs. And we also have a regular seminar series, which brings in guests from across the world. And it sort of forms the backbone of the intellectual community at the Center for Gender Studies. So I hope that's um, answered your question, CR. Thank you again, Sana. Hello again. Um, and Hayat is joining from Beirut. Hello. So Shreyoshi is uh, from Delhi and is asking, is joining the comparative literature department with an interest in South Asian queer literatures. I loved your talk and description of the space. I was wondering whether there will be opportunities for interdepartmental work offered because I would love to avail them. Okay, so our core courses, which are the gender theory and, and the uh, dissertation methods, those are closed to only gender studies students. But all the other modules I showed are actually open to anybody. So we have a number of modules where people can come in and uh, from any department, any MA student from any department can come in and take them because we want to bring people in from various other places, right? If you're in the Department of Comparative Literature or if you're doing a comparative literature um, degree, what you have is knowledges of other literatures, other knowledges apart from the Anglosphere one. So we want you in the classroom because you're the person who is going to be able to tell us if there are other stories apart from that fiction of progress that can structure gender, where we're gonna find them is in the knowledge traditions of colonized peoples. It is in complete departments. It is in literature departments, history departments. It is in Arabic studies departments where you actually have access to those knowledges, okay? So we're very, very, very open to that kind of interdisciplinary work. And that's one of the most exciting things about the gender studies space, okay? So Emily has, oh no, I skipped one, Laura, hi. Wondering what research methods are discussed in the dissertation methods course. So I taught the dissertation methods course this year and we began the year by looking, or we began the term, it's a term long course. We began the term by looking at um, Linda Tuhiwai Smith's decolonizing methodologies. So that was a text that the first couple of uh, lessons were structured around. But as the course went on, I got a sense of who is working on what kind of thesis. And so I tailored it 
according to what it is that they were interested in, what the students were interested in. So I ran a writing workshop because lots of people are interested in writing well and lots of people are interested in writing histories that um, incorporate family narratives and oral narratives lots and lots and lots of people were interested in autoethnography and ethnography as strategies for um, doing research so we ran a workshop that was on autoethnography so in this way we kind of for dissertation methods we tend to test okay where are the students at what are they going to need but you know what there's always going to be a class on interviewing on ethnography on autoethnography there's always going to be a class on writing there's always going to be a class on the politics of knowledge production there's always going to be a class that is about the technical of how you actually go about doing research okay so that's the kind of things that a dissertation methods class um, actually looks at and the whole purpose of the dissertation methods class is at the end of the term, you are asked to produce a dissertation proposal, a proposal that's just going to lay out in very, you know, sort of sketchy terms, the sort of the very first pencil sketch, if you like, of what your dissertation is going to look like. So the dissertation is the big piece of work that you're going to do during your master's, and it's a 12,000 word piece in the gender studies program. And because many people haven't done a dissertation before, the entire dissertation methods course is about gearing people up to take on a big piece of research um, like that. Okay, so Galtar from Algeria has um, applied for gender studies at SOAS next September and would like to know if you only tackle gender theory or if you link it with development policies and what's the difference between MA gender studies and MA gender studies with Middle East Perfect. Okay. So there is a gender and development module that you can take. We don't run that, okay? So the Center for Gender Studies runs a particular mode of doing and investigating gender. Some people find it incredible to do both gender theory as well as gender and development. But they're quite, I guess they're quite different approaches to how you would actually go about investigating gender, okay? Now, we have a lot of students that do both. We have some students who do ours and say, actually, the development world is what I'm more suited to. Conversely, and more often, <laughs> we get students saying, actually, the development world is very, very, very problematic. We want to be doing the Center for Gender Studies courses. So. It's one of these situations where if you can make that productive tension between gender and development discourse versus gender theory actually work for you, then you can get the best of both worlds through a degree uh, via us, okay? Um, Tanya, great. Good to know that I've been able to answer your question. Okay, so we've got a question from someone who is a lawyer in uh, Puerto Rico and applied for an LLM. You're interested in studying the law from a critical approach focused on detaching traces of colonialism and sexism. Would love to hear your thoughts on the possibility of an interdisciplinary approach to law and gender at SOAS or in your overall research experience. I mean, absolutely. The, there are a number, we at the Centre for Gender Studies are actually housed inside the School of Law. So it is a very comfortable and good home for us because we have very close relationships to many colleagues who are running gender and law uh, courses and also just law courses in general. So we would warmly welcome LLM students to be taking our courses, to be participating in our seminar series. We would likewise warmly uh, encourage all our students to be dipping their toes into various different law subjects um, because we just have very good working relationships with uh, the various different faculty members um, uh, in, in the School of Law. Now, the, if, you, if, if it is legal systems that you are specifically interested in, there's going to be, that's one of those things that we at the Centre for Gender Studies are forever 
having to pay attention to and having to center as sites of power. I mean, the entire edifice of thinking that has come after Michel Foucault says that it is the juridical system that actually constitutes the subject. And one of the people, one of the thinkers who take that and build the most incredible edifice of thinking on it is of course, Judith Butler in challenging the very category of woman and the role of the juridical system in producing that, it, any kind of big challenge that we are making to the fundamental categories through which we understand gender need to at some time or other pay attention to juridical structures. So we are never very far from engaging with, understanding, critiquing and in dialogue with juridical systems and legal epistemologies, okay? So I would say that this would be a very exciting uh, course for you if you or program for you if you took the gender studies program or if you're doing the LLM, it'd be very, very interesting for you to see it from a gender studies perspective and take some of our courses. Okay, so Ikshaku has said, thank you, I enjoyed giving it. Um, the picture I paint about department and class formats you enjoyed, okay. I've often thought about gender in the context of performance, both in the day-to-day -day and on the stage. So I wonder if there are opportunities either in the gender department or others for analyzing this. Absolutely, okay? Absolutely, performance and perform performativity are central core concepts in our gender theory course, as well as throughout our various different uh, modules. I think I had there was this incredible, I said that we had a seminar, we have a seminar, a regular seminar series. We had this wonderful, wonderful, we've actually had performances in those spaces to more robustly think about what academic knowledge and its limits are as opposed to performance as a mode of thinking. So there's all sorts of ways that either studying performance or studying um not just studying performance, but also performing <laughs> is something that can be brought into the gender studies space. And I guess, again, there, the, you know, we've got the various different, incredibly vibrant communities who are very well connected to arts worlds, who are feeding into the gender studies community and gender studies space at SOAS, via which that, that dynamism actually comes into the classroom. Yeah. Um, is the gender studies and law program equally as theoretical as it is practical? Okay, so the gender studies and law program is not, um, uh, it's not like the LLM where you are going to get some kind of accreditation or it's not, so it, it it's, it's very much one of these um, programs that has a balance between the practical and the theoretical. So that's a course, that's a program in which you are doing the gender theory, you are doing all those other modules that are um, looking very much not at legal aspects. However, at the same time, you've also got a number of law modules that will look very much into the uh, specificities of um, legal systems and how gender is operating. Now, I would strongly recommend going onto our website and checking out what the courses are and just seeing whether you like the sound of them. You'll get a sense through looking at the modules that are gender and law, okay? Now, um, oh yeah, you've asked again about the gender studies with Middle East pathways. Sorry, I forgot to answer that question, Gotho. So the gender studies Middle East pathway is in essence, your MA gender studies basic, plus you've, all, you've got to do both queer politics as well as the gender in the Middle East course. Now, both of those have regional folk regional that their, their regional focus is on the Middle East. So in essence, what you get is this very streamlined course that allows you to go through with a cohort who are also very interested in the Middle East. So in addition to your, you know, your gender studies, normal gender studies cohort, you also get to be in two classrooms, first in term one and then in term two, 
with people who are specifically interested in the Middle East. Now, you'll notice that one of them's called Gender in the Middle East and the other ones, uh, the other core of that pathway is queer politics. What is important here is one is using an area studies model, which is gender in the Middle East. You know, it's saying the Middle East as an area is what we're going to look, you know, we're going to frame as a topic of study. And the other one is taking a thematic approach to the Middle East. It's saying queer politics is the frame, is the thematic frame through which we're going to approach this particular region. So you get this quite, um, I guess, varied um, experience of what studying gender in the Middle East actually looks like because the area studies model is just one model via which you can do gender in the Middle East. So I hope that has answered your question. Okay, Likita is joining from Hyderabad in India and is planning to join the post-colonial studies course. I wanted to work on South Asian post-colonial women's literature, but there isn't a South Asian module in the gender studies modules. Is there any other way to work with the gender studies department? Okay, so you would have noticed, Likita, that I am South Asian. So I'm a historian of the British Empire and I focus on South Asia and South Asian diaspora. Right? So what ends up happening is the courses that I run and the courses, the, the lectures that I do use South Asian material and are actually focused on South Asia. So I will be, when I tell you about how development works or when I tell you about how progress narratives work or when I tell you about how race and religion and gender all work, the examples I will be using will be from Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, India, Burma, okay? This is always going to happen in a space like the Center for Gender Studies, any space in SOAS, everybody comes with a kind of regional specialization. One of, the, one of the results of that is I teach many of the core courses and I teach on many of the core courses. So on paper, you don't see that there is a South Asia focus, but there is because of who the faculty are. So when taking a look at the Center for Gender Studies courses, take a look at who the faculty is, what their regional speciality is, because then you'll get to see the the special the particular regional focus that we will actually bring to the course so having said that there's also possibilities for you know if you're doing the post-colonial studies ma you can sit in on some of our you can audit some of our courses or you can take some of our courses as um as options okay so there's plenty of opportunity to be able to work with the, the gender studies um, program. But it's, it's, I guess it's sort of ultimately about, you know, where is, which, which core course do you want to do? Okay, so if you find yourself saying, I want to do the MA Postcolonial Studies core course over the gender theory course, then go for MA Postcolonial Studies. If you want to do the MA, the gender theory course over every other core course there is, come with us, okay? But the, we very much encourage this kind of taking modules from other places. And so we're very open to post-colonial studies students coming and working with us. Okay. So we've got someone asking, what's the workload like on the two year part-time masters? Okay, that's quite a technical question because the two year part-time masters would mean that you would be, do so that's a question that you might have to actually make time with someone to talk about or go, what I suggest is you go to the gender studies page and actually click on structure of courses and have a look at how many courses you would actually have to take each year, okay? Across the entire um, degree, I believe it is 120 courses, uh, 120 credit points you have to do, but I can't off the top of my head tell you what the specific workload is going to be. Laura, is that something that you can assist with? Yeah, so um, with the part time program uh, taking two years part time, it would be roughly roughly half the workload split over the two years of the of the program. So as opposed to sort of ten to twelve hours of contact time a week, it's more likely to be about five or five or six contact hours a week. Um, 
And so with that, you know, they, they, it will depend on when the modules take place um, during that particular, that particular year as to when your class time would be. Um, so it would be worth kind of looking at your timetable at the beginning of the year, just to kind of work out exactly when your when your class time will be. And with your tutorials, your seminar sessions, um, there's often the option perhaps to choose between one or two sort of tutorial times, um, which fits in a little bit better with your part time program. Um, so I'd, I'd suggest probably sitting down at the beginning of the year and just kind of planning out your timetable a little bit just to make sure that you can make all of the contact hours for the, for the modules that, that you're hoping to attend. Thank you, Laura. Um, so I'm just making sure that I haven't missed any questions. Okay, oh, we've got Ari. Um, thanks for the talk. I was wondering what sorts of things people do after they do an MA in Gender Studies at SOAS. Great question. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of people who come in and who want to actually go on to do a PhD. So the MA can be a really great primer for a PhD program if you are that way inclined. One of the things to do is to actually see how you go with writing a thesis, see how you go with writing a 12,000 word thesis. Do you enjoy it? Do you hate it? Do you just want to be out in the sun while you're writing it? And that is a pretty good taster for whether or not that's a life suited for you. Many, many, many people go on to work in the community sector. Many people work in the NGO sector. I had students go on to um, teaching jobs and I'm talking um, primary school and high school level teaching. Now, one of the other important things, and I don't know what this is like in, you know, wherever you are, Ari, but somewhere like Bangladesh or somewhere like India, you need an MA degree in order to be able to teach at the universities. So for someone who was applying to the MA Gender Studies at SOAS, at the end of the year, they are fully qualified to work in an undergraduate classroom in a university in Bangladesh or India. Okay. Now you need to, depending on where you are, you need to work out what the MA degree, what it makes you sort of, able to, uh, what it qualifies you for. So I've just highlighted some of the, um, I guess, spaces where people work. There's also people who go on to do lots of research assistance work. I had someone joining, uh, one of my students joined um, a particular UN Women program. Um, I've had students go on to work in, um, I guess as, as research officers in larger projects. So I had a great student do this wonderful, wonderful thesis on the medical construction of um, gender. And they went on to actually get a brilliant like two year full-time research assistance position in a larger project about medical knowledge. So there's very many different pathways you can take, but I guess the community sector, the NGO sector, the education sector, these are some of the key places that I've seen some of my students go on to, okay. Um, we've got Amiti who has said we need to decolonize the human mind from the primordial thought of one gender and the other needs to be subjugated for the progress of society, which is strongly based on the presumption of the division of labor. Do matriarchal societies in Asia have answers to decolonize humans as far as gender roles are concerned? Now that sounds like something you, Amit, would have to actually investigate in the form of a master's thesis. I cannot answer that. You've asked a great question, but please come and do a master's thesis with us and answer it. Okay, <laughs> any more questions? Shreya has asked, are there work internship opportunities facilitated by the Gender Studies Department? Currently, we don't uh, do internship placements or uh, programs like that. However, what ends up happening is that through your lecturers, through your tutors, sometimes you get access to networks where people are um, offering opportunities. So for instance, one of my students 
and, and you know, this is very, very, this is the kind of thing that's very context specific. And so it's not the kind of thing we can promise, but this is what happened. This is part of what doing a master's degree at um, a place like SOAS actually means. So I guess I've got lots and lots and lots and lots of networks in Bangladesh. Um, so I had a colleague at Brack University in Bangladesh say, I've got this research project um, to do with governance and development. Do you have any students who would be suitable here? And I was able to say, yes, I have XYZ student who speak Bangla and these ones who don't speak Bangla, but are also absolutely great. Would you be interested? And so a conversation began, right? So it's kind of about building those relationships with faculty members so that faculty members will think of you as someone who is interested in working in a region that they know something about, but it is very much informal. At this stage, we don't have programs via which we offer internships. Okay, I think there's no more. There was a, will there be a student ambassador speaking about their experience on this webinar? So we have we have Ekram with us, who is a student, um, but not on the gender studies program. She's a master's student at SOAS. Um, so if you have any questions specifically for Ekram about her experiences of studying as a master's student at SOAS, please do write them in the in the Q and A section, and I'm sure Ekram will be happy to answer those. Hi everyone. Yes, if there is any questions, let me know. But I might add something in the meantime about the students that asked about part-time. So I'm, I'm a part-time master's student. Um, and although the advice is that you can choose half and half the module, like split the modules evenly between the two years part-time, um, I didn't do that. I did a bit more modules on one of the years and a bit less on the other just because it fits my timetable. Um, so that's something you can do. But in the end, you do the, the same amount of credits as the normal one year masters. And as people are thinking of questions for Ekram, um, Ikshaku has asked, does the MA Gender Studies and Law provide the chance to work part time during the program itself, perhaps in a women's or queer legal clinic or similar research role? Now, generally, people find the full time load of the MA heavy so we wouldn't recommend trying to do part-time work while you are doing the full-time ma however you can of course do the part you can do the gender and law part-time and then also do part-time work for the most part people for it, when they begin the course are like whoa this is a lot of reading so it is a it is a it's a dense intellectually very challenging uh, time, the, the MA program, the one year MA program. So that's what I would say to that, Ikshaku. I, I can see we have a few more coming through, but I'm a little bit conscious of, of time. Um, so maybe if there are maybe one or two more questions and then we'll have to close for, for the evening, but you can always contact us. Um, uh, you can contact us for general questions on the study at SOAS email address, which is just study at soas.ac.uk. Um, and I'm sure um, you can contact Samia as well on her email address if you have any further questions. Yeah, uh, so I think I can see one more question here that I could quickly answer. Laura has asked a practical question. Can I find some information about how the program is structured, a timetable or something? So what I've just pulled up, I don't know that this will be super um, helpful, but I'm hoping that it's going to be. I've, I'm going to show you, say, the timetable for the course querying migration and diaspora so you get a sense of what it might look like. Okay, so if I just go to my Zoom and share screen and share there with you. Okay, so this is the course querying migrations and diaspora. So you'll notice here that it is a course that has a one hour lecture on a Friday. And then there are these four tutorials. Now you would only go to one of those tutorials. So it's two contact hours per um, person, okay, per week. So you would go to this Friday 10 to 11 and you would also go to say a 12 to one o'clock um, uh, tutorial. So this is kind of quite standard for 
a 15 credit point course, which is your one term long course. So just imagine having how many of these you're going to have. So if you've got two hours for each, two contact hours for each of your courses, this will give you a pretty good idea of what, um, what kind of uh, timetabling you're going to be looking at. So I hope that's answered that question. Um, so I think that's probably all like, so Raphael, I'll quickly answer this question as well. There's a good sense of community between different departments at SOAS. So of course it's the classroom is your entry point into many different communities as, as in, you know, the, the cultures and languages crew have a very different feel to the gender studies crew, have a very different feel to the history crew, have a very different feel to the law crew. That apart from that kind of, disciplinary uh, community. There's all sorts of other cross SOAS communities, of course, like the student union. There's various different movements you can get involved with. So it literally is about hitting the ground and working out what your interests are, what they're crossing. But there's definitely lots and lots of, when we're on campus, it's an incredibly, incredibly vibrant student community. It's been very challenging this year for entire, you know, all of higher education, but on campus, yeah, I can confirm that there's just a lot of different modes of connecting to students across different departments. Um, I think that's probably all yeah. I can answer now. Hmm. Thank you so much, Samia, for, for such an engaging presentation and for answering all those questions as well. Um, and I've, I've certainly really enjoyed it. So thank you so much. And thank you to ECRAM as well um, for being here. And thank you to everybody who's joined the session this evening. Um, we hope it's been useful and um, hopefully see you at SOAS at some point soon. If you do have any further questions, do feel free to contact um, us either on the study at soas.ac.uk email or, or um, contact Samia if you do have any more questions for her as well. But thank you so much all for joining us. Okay, thank you everybody. Have a good night and hope to see some of you next year. <laughs>